Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I see the room is full. It's too, too small. Congratulations for organizing this. It's a challenge to put the people for hemodynamic issues where we think we know very well all the time because we have uh, pressure, flow, resistance, and concepts, physiological concepts. So we heard this for many years, so finally it's clear. But if you have to teach the young guys working with you about these issues, you understand that it's not so easy to clarify. First of all, I thank the organizers for inviting me, inviting an old guy, French, in addition to that. Talking about physiology and pathophysiology is a really risky mission. So Maurizio, maybe you did something wrong. Jean-Louis, maybe you did something wrong. We'll see. The topic they asked me to cover is vascular hyperresponsiveness. When you receive it, you say yes because you cannot say no. <laughs> but so I will think about it. And finally, uh, I spent a long time to think about that, to understand exactly what they have in their mind to be treated today. Uh, if I go back a couple of uh, centuries ago, Carl Ludwig said that the fundamental problems in the circulation derive from the fact that the supply of adequate amounts, metabolic issues as Shelley demonstrated very well, of blood to organs of the body is the main purpose of the circulation. We agree all for that. And the pressures that are necessary to achieve it are of secondary importance. Secondary importance. But the measurement of flow, which is the primary importance, is difficult. At this time, it was difficult to do. Why that pressure is easy? So that our knowledge of flow is usually derivatory. So they got only some uh, estimation. Fine. Are you dealing with the vascular hyperresponsiveness all the time? Yes, you do. Uh, you know maybe Moliere. Doing the, you are doing the prose, even you are not conscious that you are doing the prose. Because you have a patient with a low blood pressure, and that's the parameter which is stimulating the doctors the most. Pressure is fine, doctor happy. Pressure is low, doctor anxious. And doctor reacting. And what he is doing, he is doing, for example, presses, norepinephrine nor adrenaline, something which is natural. We have inside the body this norepinephrine. And we give milligrams per hour in a constant infusion, milligrams per hour. The normal concentration of norepinephrine we have in the blood at rest in this hotel with air conditioning, lying in your bed, no stimulation at all is below 0 0.050 microgram, 10 minus 6. Then you infuse milligrams on the steady state. The concentration of norepinephrine you reach in your blood is around a milligram, which means 1,000 or 10,000 more than the physiology does. This is vascular hyperresponsiveness because the pressure is still low and you give fluid, and more pressures, and you shift the pressures, and you give more fluid, and, and the guy is still in a low pressure. That's vascular hyperresponsiveness. Okay, you deal with all the time. You deal with, and what are really the consequences of this? It's very important for many issues. First of all, it's because you have this impression to give Pressures is useful for the patient because of several problems. Locally, at the resistance level, you see that you have some local or general regulation factors which are not working well. You give pressures not responding well. You give volume not responding well. You give a lot of things to improve the circulation. It doesn't work well. Hyper-responsiveness. The second question you ask is, 
maybe I want to get a good cardiac output, which is better than a good pressure. I fully agree and support what Shelley said. But the flow you generate, the systemic blood flow, where the flow goes to, depends on the goal. If you think the brain is a major organ you should resuscitate, and then the flow to this organ is not good enough, you focus your intensive care strategy to this organ, not to the systemic blood flow. If it's the liver, if it's the gut, if it's blah, 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 you have to just reorganize, which means that you have to know where the flow goes to. And maybe some organs may differ from another. Not maybe, surely. Then you arrive to the organ. For example, you, you're able to measure the blood flow in the gut, in the liver, in the kidney, in the brain. You know the blood flow. Are you happy with? I'm more happy, but I would like to know more what's going on to the tissue, to the cells. Then you are interested in the microcirculation distribution of this regional blood flow. Because you can get a huge regional blood flow which is going through a freeway and no chance to go to the small roads. So the cells are ischemic, but the flow is huge. Are you happy with? You can be happy, but the cells are not. That's the point. It's very important to keep in mind all these issues because we deal all the time with this. So we have a lot of randomized trials. Uh, congratulations for the society giving some recommendations that we we reasonably follow because they are logic physiologically, but we deal in the case-to-case -case patients. We don't treat the patients as a cohort. We apply some concept coming from the cohorts to the patients. It works or doesn't work well. Depends on the patients and the doctors too, maybe. So you have two types of deal. First is the elective surgery in the, in the OR. You go there and say, ah, this is a nice patient today. A ASC score is good, no risk. I inject, I give fluid, the surgeon does, I awake. Next, money, that's it. <laughs> For this patient, you are getting the patients because you think that you have just to conserve the normal value, the normal hemodynamic values, elective surgery. Physiology can be applied. And then, in the other sense, you have the critically ill patients, emergency room, intensive care, recovery room, whatever. And these guys are not really normal, and they have some specific inflammation or disturbances. For this, the physiology cannot be applied. And then you are looking for variables, which are just the good one, to give the chance to the patients to recover which might be the same than the theoretical range or another one. You force, you push more because to recover is essential to push more. And that's a very important personalized medicine we do for the critically ill patients, which might be different than the global medicine or the core values we get for the physiological patients. Then of course the, the tools and the goals you use for achieving it might be very different and then you have different strategy for the patients if you're in the OR and the ICU. The first one you deal with is blood pressure. Everybody loves blood pressure. I don't understand why, but they do. Why do you love blood pressure? Because you get it. If you have something as simple as a, a method to measure blood pressure, to measure the blood flow, you will use it non-invasive, cheap, easy to use, accurate, blah, 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 then you measure the blood flow. You don't have it, you measure the blood pressure. You like heart rate. What do you do with? Nothing. Except if you have uh, arrhythmias or if you have the bradycardias, except of these two extremes, what are you doing with the rhythm? Nothing. Agree? It's there. If it's not there, you see the patient is not there too. So finally, you know that. So the blood pressure is different than the flow, but you measure the blood pressure to get an idea of the perfusion to the tissues. And Shelley told you that mm, maybe it's doubtful and the blood flow would be better than the blood pressure to know if you have to make a choice. 
The pressure goes down because of what? Because you lose the vascular tone. You dilate. Suddenly something happens. You inject an antibiotic during the surgery. Uh-oh, allergy. Boom, pressure goes down. The tone is gone. You give some sedative drugs, but the residents doubled the dose and made a mistake. We said the residents because it's easier to say that, but I can do the mistake too. <laughs> Two milligrams instead of one, boom. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, the surgeon is doing something and then is getting a hole in the gut and you see, whoo, the stools in the peritoneum. My goodness. You look at this. <clears throat> yeah, I, I did a stool. I'm washing and then and you see the bacteria and you know, the toxin goes to the blood and then the pressure goes down. Uh-huh. That's a loss of vascular tone. You can have an abnormal control of the vascular tone. You give beta blocking agents. I know that some people love to give. Boom, then you block any reactions. If you need some tachycardia, finished, blocked, pressure goes down. You give some alpha blocking agents. People love to give alpha blocking agents. The vascular reactivity is blunted. If you need some constriction, gone. Pressure goes down. Uh -huh. You get abnormal brain function. You have an abnormal or, or stroke on the, on the brain stain. The control of the blood pressure is altered, so you don't have the control of the vascular tone, the pressure goes down. Uh -huh. Of course, if you have a cardiac failure, simple, everybody understands, the pressure can go down when the pump doesn't work well. And of course, when the return function is altered, acute hypovolemia, but we speak about only acute hypovolemia all the time, all the meetings along. I don't understand that. We don't need this discussion for hours and hours, hypovolemia, how much fluid, what type of fluid, uh, assessed by what. Some have, but not all. We don't know the incidence of this so-called hypovolemia because we cannot define hypovolemia. It's just on blood pressure. So it's a redundant mechanism. We don't know who is right, who is wrong. So finally, the blood pressure is going down. The clinician is alarmed. What he is doing? A reflex, a monosynaptic reflex <laughs> is I give fluid. Because it's, for, blood pressure goes down, it's, it's hypovolemia. And give fluids because he made some assumptions. The fluid you give is on the peripheral vein, vein, to increase the blood pressure, which is the, the arterial side. Between this vein and the fluid you give and the pressure you generate, you have a lot of things which happens. Mm -hmm. The assumptions is I give volume because the volume will increase the flow and the flow will increase the blood pressure. That's the way the clinician thinks, right? You agree? Be honest, between you and me. <laughs> it's not true, of course. First of all, the volume you give, as uh, Shelley told you, a fraction of this is becoming stress volume. Means circulating. The other one is filling, but not circulating too much. A fraction of the volume you give is circulating. That is why you give 250 cc's to one, and you generate three liters more for flow. And some other you give one liters, and you get only one liter of flow more. So in other words, the response to the volume you give is extremely heterogeneous because the function, the transfer function between the volume you give and the flow you generate is extremely complex. Uh-huh. <coughs> My goodness. So the volume you give is supposed to be transformed in a stress volume, which is true or not, depending on the patients. And secondly, the flow you generate, you expect that this flow going up will be transferred in a higher pressure, which is not true, of course. Sometimes, but not frequently. Because if you increase the flow, and then you expect the increase in pressure, that means that the, the tone, the vascular tone, is constant. Are you sure that when you give volume to someone, 
the vascular tone is constant, I'm not sure. So, same equation that uh, Shirley showed. Blood pressure is regulated. In other words, all the system, God, I don't know what kind of God, please. I'm not speaking about typical God, but God globally. The guy who built the machine decided that the blood pressure has to be within normal ranges. It's true for the snake, it's true for the kangaroo, and it's true for the human beings. The normal value for the kangaroo is 130, the mean arterial pressure. For the snake, do you know the normal value? <laughs> you don't know. You never did the uh, intensive care for the snake. Okay. <laughs> I did in Australia. It's 40. And we are in between. So finally, this value is really very well regulated by local factors and general factors. And the flow move up, moves up and down to adapt to keep the pressure value normal. The same for the resistances. They move up and down the vascular tone to maintain the blood pressure. Then, if you are just reacting when the pressure goes down, that means that you react late because all the factors before have tried to maintain the pressure and finally they were not successful enough and then you see the blood pressure going down and you react, but you react late. The vascular tone is determined by local factors, prostaglandins, nitric oxide, and the them derived hyperpolarizing factors, coagulation factors, and also by general factors, the sympathetic, the parasympathetic, the angiotensin and the vasopressin molecules, all of these have receptors on the peripheral vessels and the vascular vessels, the small one, the big one, and the venules. You have also the other factors which are supposed to regulate the vascular tone. Hemodynamic, hemodynamic physical factors, the blood pressure inside the vessel, the pressure surrounding the vessels, and uh, Shelley speak about the uh, waterfall phenomenon. If you have a pressure surrounding the venous pressure, which is over the venous pressure, you collapse the vein. The same for the vessel, the arterial vessels. If you have a pressure over the diastolic pressure on the arterial way, you collapse or you reduce the caliber of the arterial vessels. The shear stress is a key one, and you have also the function of the endothelial cells and the smooth muscle cells, which are talking together with the blood and with the small cells. They are very crucial partners. Just an example for that. Here, just the white symbols, the open symbols. You see the open cycles. Is a rat anesthetized? getting some uh, time to recover. And then here you see the blood pressure is stable. The flow is stable a long time. And is, here is the cardiac function, the systolic cardiac function, the, 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 the acceleration of the blood. Then the square is the healthy animals receiving nitric oxide blocking agents. You see, when you infuse the blocker of nitric oxide, the pressure goes up and the flow goes down. So clearly, you have a constraint. If you block the nitric oxide, you constrict and you increase the pressure. So finally, the nitric oxide is exerting a tonic dilatation in healthy situations. Then, if you give fluid, you see, in healthy animals, you give a huge amount of fluid, pressure goes up a bit, the flow does not change too much, so you dilate, clearly. And you see when you block the dilatation uh, mediated by nitric oxide, you see the pressure goes up, the, the cardiac output goes up, and you blend this with the nitric oxide blocking agent. So nitric oxide is responsible for the dilatation induced by the fluid you give to the patients. And you do that every day in the OR or in the ICU, when you give fluid, you see a bump of pressure coming back to the previous level. The flow goes up, which means that you dilated the patients. And dilating the patients, if you block with the nitric oxide donors, you see the pressure goes up and the flow goes down. It's exactly the same in patients. So finally, the nitric oxide is a mediator for the fluid-induced dilatation, which is a physiological concept. When you are creating an acute inflammation, the black symbols, you get exactly the same 
patterns that you had in healthy animals. So in other words, in acute inflammation, as in the physiology, blocking the nitric oxide does the same thing. Okay, what is important? The numbers that you can get from the blood pressure or the wave shape. You look at the wave. Are you getting some information on the wave shape, uh, which may help you to understand what is the vasomotor control? Yes, you can get a lot of information from the wave because you see the impact of the reflective waves, you see the impact of the vascular compliance, the impact of the real resistance or impedance, and the impact of the surrounding pressure. If it's there, you can get a lot of edema, but not too much. If it's a femoral one, you can get a lot of edema here. If it's uh, on the brain, you can get a lot of surrounding pressure over the intracerebral pressure. So finally, all of this may change the, 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 the shape of the pressure wave. Here's the example showing that. You have, in this pressure wave, you have the forward pressure wave ejecting from the LV to the periphery. And then you get a backward, which is coming back from the periphery to the heart, the reflective wave. And then this wave may come more or less rapidly to the heart. If it's very short, it comes at the beginning of the systole. If it's very dilated and it's time to go and uh, go back slowly, it comes late on the diastole. And then with this, you have a remarkable point you can see on the blood pressure wave. You have the so-called points of instability. We call this with Stefano, point of uh, uh, instability, which are telling you what's going on for the vasomotor situation of the patients. Here you see the forward wave. Then here you have a reflected wave, which is amplifying the systolic pressure. So you get the impression that the systolic pressure is fine because it's good number, but the systolic pressure is not a perfusion pressure. It's a pressure coming back from the summation of backward plus forward. Then the two together is giving a good number, but a low perfusion because this one is not perfusing well. And that's an important issue, you know, for the elderly people. We are dealing with elderly people all the time. You see the normal shape in the healthy and young guy going to the surgery or being in the ICU. Then in the elderly, you have a huge systolic pressure. And we speak all the time about the systolic hypertension in elderly people. And the problem is, should we treat or not? If you treat this, and if the systolic pressure is essentially due to the backward wave, not the forward one, then the forward wave is becoming lower, and then you get a stroke. Even the numbers seem to be adequate. You get a stroke because the perfusion by this pressure is small. And that's a key issue to remember, and nobody thinks about that usually in the OR or in the ICU. Here is the uh, remarkable point of decratic notch. Decratic notch is the point where the, the forward and the backward waves are crossing together. You see here all of these tracings are tracing with the same mean arterial pressure given by the computer. And then if you look at this, the decratic notch, the end of the systole, when the valves are closing, is very low compared to this one, is very high. Same mean arterial pressure, and clearly we have different situations for the two patients. And we look and we are happy to get the measurements of the decratic notch pressure. The vascular structure which play a role in this are the following. First of all, the endothelial cells. Endothelial cell, we speak about the endothelium, but the endothelium is extremely heterogeneous. You can get very different endothelial cells everywhere on the body. The pancreas, you have a specific tight junction. In the, smooth, in the skeletal muscles, you have some kind of uh, uh, invagination of the endothelial cells. If you go to the colon, you have some abnormal, apparently abnormal, fenestrated endothelium, which is very uh, permeable endothelial cells. Then the function of endothelial cells is absolutely crucial, and we don't deal too much with when we are thinking about the patients. This is uh, endothelial cells in culture. Uh, with no flow, no pressure, no mechanics in. Then you do the same thing with the pressure and flow, 
and you see the cells are oriented differently, the cytoskeleton is changing, and the function of these cells is changing too. So clearly, it's important to consider this. The vasoregulation is related to nitric oxide, prostaglandins, endothelin, the PATH, the angiotensin, and many others. Coagulation factors, of course, and interactions with the circulating white blood cells, lymphocytes, polymorphinuclear cells, and macrophages. Normally, you see here, you have a lot of interactions through the receptors or the release of mediators between the blood and the endothelial cells. They are always interacting together to control the coagulation and to control the tone, the vascular tone. Here you see for the vascular tone, the NOS, the endothelial NOS is releasing nitric oxide, relaxing the smooth muscle cells, opening the tight junctions at the capillary level, uh, or dilating the veins uh, by releasing nitric oxide at the venule side. And that's absolutely crucial because it may change the venous resistances. Then, if you have flow and pressure, what happens? You have, first of all, the control of the tone by the prostacycline, which is mediated by the cyclic AMP, which is increasing under the prostacycline, relaxing the smooth muscle cells. You have the so-called EDHF, hyperpolarization factor, sorry, which is opening the potassium channels and then relaxing the smooth muscle cells. You get, of course, the nitric oxide, which is through the GTP, GMP cyclic, is increasing uh, the relaxation of the smooth muscle cells. But this nitric oxide is interacting with all the other cells, platelets, red cells, and leukocytes. Based on that, you have reactions for activation, which might be classified in two phases, a rapid one and a slowdown. The rapid one is a matter of seconds, minutes, and the longer one is a matter of hours. And this uh, two response may uh, follow in time, and they are responsible for the classical symptoms you see, the rubber, the color, the tumor, and the pain. Then if you go to the uh, physiology uh, related to exercise, you see here the normal vessels with the endothelial cells, the smooth muscle cells, and the caliber. Then you do the physical exercise every day. You are chronically trained for that. What are you doing? You stimulate the blood velocity on your vessels, and the blood velocity is increasing the diameter of the vessels through this uh, prostaglandin nitric oxide EDHF, and then this dilatation is training the vessels to relax. Then you stop your exercise, but you keep the dilated vessels for a while. And that's the way you adapt to the physical exercise, not only the oxygen consumption and the performance. Of course, if you are damaging these endothelial cells, here you see when you damage the endothelial cells with a balloon, a catheter, or whatever, you see you cannot dilate anymore with the higher velocity. You lose this dilatation due to the shear stress. And then if you put a radial catheter, for example, you see you lose the capability of the radial, catheter, the, the radial artery to dilate if you increase the flow. So finally, the same for the coronary bypass. If you look at this, people trained are really responding to acetylcholine, the parasympathetic pathway, better than the people who are not trained. I skip this one. Just to tell you that when you have an inflammation or an acute disease, all these factors may change also the endothelial cells function. So you can use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents. So the people are using this all the time. You get a pain, you go to the pharmacy, you say, I would like to get the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents. But this is extremely dangerous drug. It cannot be in the free market. I'm against that. You lose the control of the vascular tone, you lose the immunity, you lose many things. But you can buy freely. That's, that, that's fine for you. All of the other uh, drugs may interfere with the, with the endothelial cells, the statins, the IL-1 uh, receptor antagonists, and all of these are susceptible to change the, the response of the endothelial cells. So you can assess this vascular responsiveness in vivo or ex vivo. Ex vivo is easy because you use organ bath, you go to the lab at the time you want to do it, then you take a ring, you put two cross, 
and then you measure the mechanical uh, uh, action created by the contraction of the vessels, and then you know on the dose response fashion what happens for the drug you are testing. You can do the animal experiments, but for the clinicians it's not easy, and what you can do for the human beings. This is the organ bath. I don't have time because the time is running. Just to tell you that with this uh, organ bath system, cutting some rings of human vessels, for example, is coming from septic patients. Uh, the, the people in, 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 in Strasbourg demonstrated very nicely the first, Jean-Claude Stockley, that the contractility of the vessels is totally altered when you get a sepsis. So finally, you have hyper-responsiveness of the vessels, isolated vessels, when you get a sepsis. So when we did the same for <coughs> rabbits, and we treated the rabbits with uh, a membrane to absorb the endotoxin, the endotoxin is supposed to be a major determinant of inflammation, then you see here, when you have the endotoxin, <coughs> you see the dose-response curve for norepinephrine is altered with uh, the endotoxin, and when you use the membrane to absorb the endotoxin, you see you recover the normal response of the vessels to norepinephrine. So that is a classic way to assess something. It's true for the contraction, but it, it, it's, it, it's also true for the relaxation. So you can see a modification of contraction, but also the inability of the vessels to dilate. If you do this experiment, you'll see here the acetylcholine is reducing, you know, the, 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 the vascular tone, dilating the vessels. And then when you treat this, you see with the inflammation, you reduce the ability of dilatation when you block the nitric oxide activity. So finally, both sides, contraction and dilatation, might be impaired in acute inflammation. So just to show you this, here is the low pressure doing endotoxin in rabbits. The diameter of the aortic vessel was five, and here is the same low pressure in rabbits, but in use by nitroprusside, <coughs> by the vasodilatating drugs, anodoners. You see the diameter is 6.4, and here it's five, with the same pressure. It means that you are dilating the vessels with nitroprusside, and you're constricting the vessels with the LPS, so you have a reduction in compliance in acute inflammation. Just an example to say, okay, you give fluid and pressors. You see here the rabbits, the blood pressure goes down when you inject the endotoxin. You give fluid, mm, the pressure does not go up. We discussed that before. The flow goes up. The mesenteric blood flow improved. The big, the big artery blood flow improved, but the mesenteric microflow did not change, and the hepatic blood flow microflow did not change too. So, okay, I will give some pressures to see if increasing the blood pressure, because you like to increase the blood pressure. So you increase the blood pressure, you see the flow does not change. The mesenteric blood flow does not change, but of course you have no effect on the microcirculation. So the pressure is better, but the microcirculation is the same. And we have differences between the sensitivity or the reactivity between territories. The hepatic is, seems to be not really sensitive to the dose of vasopressin, and the mesenteric blood flow and mesenteric microcirculation seems to be very sensitive to the vasopressin. So that's an important issue because it might be very dangerous for the, for the patients. So we move on, and just to say, You can do with the microcirculation using a laser Doppler. And the laser Doppler is a very non-invasive, easy to use. You stick the probe on the skin, very simple, and you know what happens. You see here the normal uh, phasic or undulation uh, of the laser Doppler in healthy people. You do the occlusion test for three minutes, no flow, and then you get a huge hyperemic response. That's a normal response. Here in, in septic patients, you see the flow is almost zero. You block it, and then you don't have any uh, hyperemic response. So that's a characteristic of abnormal vasoreactivity you can check in patients. The same after cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest, you do the resuscitation, and you have a whole, blood, a whole body 
uh, reperfusion syndrome, which is an acute inflammation. Again, you don't have any response. So just to finish, that's something that I would like to emphasize maybe in the future we can use this. We would like to know what is the reactivity of the vessels, not only the blood pressure, not only the systemic blood flow, not only the global one, but we would like to know something more, 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 more specialized, more focused. Here is the test we did on the ear lobe. And the ear lobe, we put a transducer to measure the CO2 and to measure the pulse activity. It, uh, it uh, a, a double, uh, a double uh, parameter system. With a PCO2, you measure heat. If it's high, it means that the tissue releases CO2, but the blood is not washing. Then you have a stagnant hypercapnia. And the less is the, 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 the flow, the higher is the CO2. Then if you improve the flow locally, you see the PCO2 goes down. Here you see that in healthy people, in hemorrhagic people, you have the same. When you warm, you warm the, the transducer here, you use the warming as a functional test for the vessels from 37 degrees Celsius to 42, three minutes. Then warming means dilating the vessel. You know you have a red ear lobe when it's very, very hot. Then here you are dilating and you see the CO2 goes down, which is normal and true for the hemorrhagic shock. In septic shock patients, curiously, you warm and the CO2 does not go down, it goes up. In other words, you are not recruiting vessels, they are not pulsatile, they are not better perfused. Here is the pulsatile index. You have uh, platysmography here, which is measuring the pulse. You'll see the pulse is becoming high when you warm the earlobe. It's becoming high when you warm the airlock, even in the hemorrhagic shock, so the vessels are normally reactive. But in septic shock, you, you can warm the, the airlock. It does not, yeah, it does not uh, uh, pulse more. So that might be a way to assess the vascular reactivity in patients. I skip this. It's for the break. So to conclude, we can say that the, the vessel reactivity is a crucial parameter for blood pressure and flow to know if it's adapted or not. The systemic response is totally different than the regional one and depends on the goal of your resuscitation you would like to do. The tone is regulated by local factors and integrated reflex factors. The two major actors for this, for the vessel structures, are the endothelium and the smooth muscle cells. We don't know too much about the endothelium except that it does a lot of things, but we have to target this more frequently. It can be damaged, then when the endothelial cells is damaged like we have in sepsis, in acute inflammation, the regulation of the vascular tone might be very abnormal and the smooth muscles might be damaged also as a cell suffering from acute inflammation, apoptosis or energetic failure which may change also the reactivity of the system. So thank you very much for your attention and sorry for the blocking.